by a large body of water. And the south, as you may remember, uh, is where Sparta is located, and Sparta was always at war with Athens, so it's north and south, the two battle between the north and the south, very, two very different uh, civilizations. However, that was prior to Paul's time. In Paul's time, Corinth was a Roman colony, and it gives me a tremendous amount of appreciation for the kind of man he was and his single-minded dedication and commitment to fulfilling the commission that Christ himself had given him. And Jesus said, listen, Paul, you're not going to have it easy. You're going to, you're going to have a rough time, but this is what I require of you. And Paul said, yes, Lord, okay. And time and time again, he proved that he was willing to lay down his life, to sacrifice his comfort, to sacrifice his own personal goals, his own personal well-being for whatever it was Jesus had in store for him. And he not only did it willingly, but he embraced it. And to me, that's a very, very humbling thing. When you compare that kind of bedrock Christian faith, absolute faith, to that which is preached and practiced in much of the church today, you see a sharp distinction. And he wanted so much for them to be on a good footing, a right footing with their faith with their belief to be responsible stewards of their salvation. to the Acropolis, which is the fortification overlooking ancient Corinth. And I, I tell you, well, we, you saw the picture of what it looked like from down at sea level. And uh, well, here we are at the top of it. And it's amazing to think that <laughs> that people came all the way up here and fortified it with this, this amazing stonework. And they started doing this back around 500 BC, where it was a smaller fortification, and then it just grew and grew over the years until the Byzantine Empire uh, just went crazy with all these walls and, and encircled this whole area. But there was a, a settlement here in Paul's day, and Paul came up here, and the, the tradition has it that he witnessed, uh, he testified at the uh, Temple of Aphrodite. Now Aphrodite is the goddess of love and in those days there were about a thousand temple prostitutes who worked at that, uh, that temple. And there were a thousand more down in the old city who worked down there. And he came up here and he preached the gospel. Now I wonder what his uh, reception was like. Paul was a very determined person. He would have had to been determined just to get up here. but. Uh, once he got here, he was so possessed by the Spirit of God and the message that he was bringing was one in which God is reaching out to man rather than man reaching out to God. All the other religions of the, of the planet tell the story of man reaching out to God to try to find and understand God. Only the Judeo-Christian has God reaching out to man. And this, is, this was a revelation for people in Paul's day, where 
there was a, a god behind every rock and under every shrub and you had to pay homage to all of them. You had to be careful not to offend any of them. And, and the message of a loving God uh, who was reaching out to them, not only reaching out to them, but had provided a way to, forgive, for, to provide forgiveness for their sins. Uh, and then to, to welcome them into his embrace was just such a revolutionary and transformational message. Well, obviously, in the course of the next couple of hundred years, that message brought all the other gods in Europe to their knees. All the Norse gods, the Greek gods, the Roman gods, the Teutonic gods, the gods of the, of the uh, Germanic peoples, and the gods of the Celts. In the course of a couple of hundred years, that simple message that, that Paul brought here to Corinth all those years ago uh, resonated to such an extent, caused such a spiritual earthquake, that all of those gods fell before the one true God and the message of love. And that's the message that Paul brought to this church. And in the letters to the Corinthians, it's, it's interesting I say earthquake because this, this area it's not pleasant to think of at the moment, but it's very prone to earthquakes. And there have been a couple of times in, in history where the city of Corinth, which was founded as many as 6,000 years ago, the city itself was destroyed utterly by, uh, by earthquakes. And it was each time it was rebuilt uh, in the same area. It was also reduced to ashes by, uh, by various conquerors, uh, one of whom, his name was Lucius Mamias, and he was a uh, Roman general, and this would have been uh, 145 BC. He, he conquered Corinth, and uh, because they had put up such a fierce resistance, he, uh, when he had conquered the city and gotten inside the city, he slaughtered all the male population and then took the, uh, the women and children into slavery. Then he burned the city, uh, destroyed it completely. It was Julius Caesar who refounded the city in 42 BC, about two years before he was assassinated. And uh, he commissioned the city be rebuilt, and that's the city that Paul knew when he was here, the city of Corinth. This, this Acropolis up here uh, obviously hadn't been burned, so it was somewhat older but it had been built to defend the lower city of Corinth, which was a trading center. And the city is really sits at a perfect area geographically because it it's occupies the, the northern tip of an isthmus between two bodies of water and between two, uh, two land masses, one of which is the Peloponnesian Peninsula, and the other one is Greece proper. And so at this juncture it had, it had uh, Levy, it could levy taxes on people who were going from sea to sea. And it's interesting because now there's a canal that connects those two seas. But in those days there was no canal, though a couple of attempts had been made to, to build one. But what they did instead was they built a roadway uh, that went up over that landmass between the two bodies of water. And they actually pulled the seagoing vessels up over that roadway from one side to the other, saving that trip around the southern tip of the Peloponnesian Peninsula, which was, was deadly waters in those days. But just shows the, the amazing uh, ingenuity and determination of, of what you can get done when you have vast amounts of people and absolute authority to do whatever you want to. But uh, anyway, so that's the Corinth that, was, that existed. It was a very flourishing city. In Paul's day, there were about 90,000 people who lived there. And as I say, it was, it was really Sin City in, in its day. Uh, imagine Las Vegas taken to an extreme. And this is where people would come to exercise their hedonistic lifestyles. And that was the, those were the Christians that Paul, uh, with whom Paul created his church. These Christians were, these new believers, had been raised in this, this hedonistic lifestyle, this hedonistic mindset. So imagine the, the hurdles that Paul had to overcome, because not only did he have to give them this new message of God's love and, and God's reaching out to them and providing salvation, which was a wonderful word, but also at the same time, he had to, to define what Christianity is in the context of the world. How does, how does Christian behavior modify itself in order to to form a distinction between itself and the world around it. And that's the, the message in Paul's letters to the Corinthians. 
Now scholars say that there were probably four, maybe more letters, but probably four letters uh, to the Corinthians in all. Uh, our first and second Corinthians are probably the second and fourth letters. Now this is inferred from mention that was made in the existing letters as we know them to other letters. One was called the letter of tears. Uh, that Paul referred to in 2 Corinthians. So we can assume that there was at least one other letter and uh, other indications in Corinthians are that there were that there were four altogether. But the two that we have uh, form such a bedrock to to the Christian faith as we know it today. They're, they're, they're foundational really to Christianity uh, today. And in it, in those letters, Paul grappled so many issues. Uh, a lot of a lot of what he had to do was, uh, or a lot of his message was, how Christians live with one another. Uh, how do Christians function within the church? What's the responsibility of the of the church proper, the administrative body of the church? How do Christians relate to the world around them? How do Christians modify their behavior in order to be in alignment with God and God's will? And you can, you, if when you read those letters, First and Second uh, Corinthians, you see that these things are all being addressed, and they're not being addressed in a way that is that's really confrontational, but it's just very uncompromising. And at the same time, there's this tremendous message of love. Paul's definition of love is one that is. Well, it's unsurpassed in all of literature. I, I love Shakespeare, and I think Shakespeare was a master of the language, but he never came close to accomplishing and defining what love is than to, to what Paul did in the letters to the Corinthians. It's just astounding. But this is the context. This is what he was relating to. This is the world that he was in. And I just thought it might be interesting to, sh to share that. And putting things in context like that really gives an immediacy to Paul's letters to us. They're, not, they're just not cold letters, uh, a voice from the past. They're present. And they were given to Paul to give to us. And it was not for no reason that that was done. God knew what he was doing. And this is a message that he wanted to resonate through the church and through the ages. And uh, we're just, just happy to be here now and to be able to share this, this time and to share this message in the context that Paul shared it. We're going to go down to the, to the old city now and uh, I'll talk to you a little bit from there. Thanks. So this is where Paul came, and I want you to try to envision what this was like in those days. Of course, now it's just it's just ruins. But where I'm standing was the edge of the of the forum, and the forum is over here, which has just been a high hive of activity at, at all times. And this is where Paul came to begin preaching his message. Often, people would gather in the agora and in the forum to hear new ideas. Paul said they love to have their ears tickled. This is where they'd come to get the tickling done. But you have to appreciate, like I was saying at the top of the Citadel, the, the spiritual environment here. There were gods everywhere. Every bush, every building had a god. The god Apollos was the main god in this area and that temple was built in 500 BC and it was one of the few things left standing after the massacre of 145 BC and all of the rest of the this structure was came into being because of Julius Caesar but when Paul got here he had no trouble finding an audience for new ideas they loved that they loved to hear what was going on and people from all parts of the empire would eventually end up going through Corinth. New ideas were always welcome. Doesn't mean they were accepted, and Paul soon found that out. 
And this is where Priscilla and Aquila, this is where he met them. He joined them in the tent making business and it's very likely that they conducted that business right over there. The shops that lined that street over there, that side of the forum, there was another row of shops over there. So this is very likely where they would have plied their trade and where they would have made their tents and sold their tents and this is where business was conducted. Paul would have known these as complete buildings and relatively new buildings uh, by Roman standards, only 80 years old, where Paul shared his ideas and, and brought the gospel and people would listen to him. And generally, it was a place, one place where speakers knew visitors to the city where they'd stand and they'd just begin proclaiming whatever news they had to proclaim. And Paul stood in that spot overlooking the, the forum and began to proclaim the gospel. This is where it was done. We came to uh, Philippi, and then to Thessalonica, and then to Berea, and then Corinth was his, after Athens was his, really his first big conquest because he started a church here that lasted a long time. And as I said, it was a church that encountered all, every sort of vicissitude that the churches in America or churches in the West, churches in the world face today. Problems of personality, of leadership, of, of moral behavior, of spiritual alignment, of interpretation of scripture. There's nothing new under the sun, and Paul addressed all those issues. Corinth was the crucible of Christianity. It was really the birthplace of New Testament theology. Up to that point, it was still formative. I mean, Paul had spent 12, 12 to 15 years on his own in the wilderness sort of formulating how to interpret the, the experience that he had had. And what it would mean to, to the future interpretation of Scripture for, for the church. And by the time he'd gotten to Corinth, he'd been a Christian a long time, but he was dealing with people who were brand new Christians and they were brought up in a very hedonistic uh, part of the world. So he had to reinterpret all of his experiences, all that he had learned over all those years. Uh, he had to sort of synopsize that for the people in this church. And it's a testament to, to the way he was able to balance the message together with its call for a different lifestyle of separation from the, from the world. And he did really an amazing job with it. And it's the blueprint for the Christianity that we practice today, and it's a challenge to us. It's a challenge to us because what he did was redefine love. You know, we we're talking about Aphrodite and the temple prostitutes, and and sexual hedonistic behavior was sort of how how they interpreted or defined love, much like we do today. And Paul was saying that's not love. That's not love. Love is what God did for us in sacrificing his son for our salvation. And love is, then he goes into the beautiful, ver the beautiful chapter in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. And it's just amazing. As a matter of fact, I'll read it for you now as we look at these pictures. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Paul wrote the letters to the Corinthians from Ephesus and from Macedonia. And it is from Corinth that he wrote his letters to the Romans. So 
in many ways it's it's with that absence of heart that he was feeling uh, being apart from this church that he loved so much that he was writing to them across what in those days were great distances Ephesus is in Turkey and uh, Macedonia is in northern Greece good gone good ways away but his heart you know was was so passionate toward these people and toward this church and he had a very much a a father's heart, I think, toward this church. Uh, he had given it birth, and together with Silas and Timothy, and it's just amazing to think that they walked right here. Silas and Timothy and Paul and Pris Priscilla and Aquila, they walked right here. They lived here. He lived here for 18 months in one period and three months in another period. So he knew the city, and uh, the city probably knew him because he was not a quiet individual. Uh, Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this uh, sort of brief history of, of the city of Corinth. And I encourage you, if you ever get a chance, to come. You can almost hear the echo of, of uh, his words and of their praise, their songs of praise in some tiny little church here, raised in the night together with the song of the birds, which is so prevalent. And it's... it's uh, you can hear their echo, you know, and their echo echoes still across the ages, the echo of Paul's words. Um, so thank you. Hope you've enjoyed this little, this little trip and that it's given you a deeper appreciation of Paul and of his letters to the Corinthians and of Corinth itself and what life was like uh, in those days in Paul's world.